It's Adam from Loose Pixel. Today I want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, a face-to-face, -face, because what I want to share with you is a culmination of experience that I've gained through riding the waves of success and standing in the stagnant waters of failure over 20 years, if not close, closer to 25 years in my artistic career. Today's talk is going to speak to artists at many different phases in their career, whether you're somebody who's just starting it off and trying to launch a career, maybe you're in the middle of it, or maybe you've been enjoying a career through your own share of successes and failures for decades, like me, okay? In order to add some weight, some value, some validity to the words that I'm sharing, I want you to know where I'm coming from. I'm somebody who's been working in the art industry for decades, for, like I said, two to two and a half decades already. I have worked as a junior, intermediate, and senior artist. I've worked as a junior, intermediate, and senior animator. I've worked in 2D animation. I have worked in 3D animation. I then went on to become an artistic director for film, TV shows, animated shows, games in big studios, and tiny studios. I've worked in teams of 12. I've worked in teams of 500. And then I ended up getting into teaching where I taught in public schools for many years in animation and in art. And then in 2015, I started my passion job as an online teacher. I, I founded the Lucid Pixel private online art mentorship and have been doing so very passionately to this day and have many years, many, many years ahead of me. Okay. Through all of this, and through many of the stories that I've shared with you, there are times, there are periods in my life where things were not working my way whatsoever. In fact, I felt like the worst of the worst. I felt like I was at the bottom of the barrel. And there are other times where I'm sitting down and having lunches with general managers of companies like Electronic Arts, okay? Or sitting and having meetings with the heads at Disney. I've been in both of those positions in my life. But most importantly, through my own successes and failures, I have also worked with literally thousands of students, one at a time, private one-on-one -on -one calls since 2015. And I have gotten a chance to meet an innumerable number of incredible, passionate, talented, and motivated people. However, in many of the cases, some of them have a really hard time succeeding. Some of them succeed extremely quickly and extremely easily. Some of them succeed for a long time and then find themselves in a place where all of a sudden the rug got pulled out from under them and they don't know what the hell to do with themselves. In many, many different situations, and I've witnessed and have helped coach people who have worked their asses off to navigate their way through that. And get I to, for me, it's about getting behind the person. It's about understanding the person behind these successes and failures and where these obstacles might lie in their own career. So I broke it down into three different categories. It's not an exhaustive list, but I think that the, these are three of the most important. These are the, these are the three most common things. And I'd like to start it with what I think Dr. Romani was doing a video on, she just did a, she just did an interview with Diary of a CEO and she was talking about different types of narcissists. That's not what this is about. This isn't about narcissism. This is about art careers. But she used the term failure to launch, talking about personality types, failure to launch personality types. And I think you know where I'm going with this. There are many artists out there that spend years and years and years either straight out of school or not in school, they've taken online courses, which is just as good nowadays. I've seen just as many successes through people who, who are self-taught in that regard. But for some reason, for one reason or another, they just can't get off the ground. They can't launch their career. For most of us, this is normal. We spend the first, you know, several years, five years, even up to 10 years, struggling to get things going, struggling to get momentum, to get recognized, updating your portfolio, working harder, polishing yourself up, consulting with different people, taking courses, etc. until eventually mm, that plane comes off the ground. 
and we start to get that momentum. Sure, throughout careers like that, the plane comes off the ground and it might land again and it might go off again. It's kind of like leaving the nest, leaving mommy and daddy's house and then having to go back every now and then when finances are shit. <laughs> yes, I've been there too. I've been back to mommy's house a couple of times myself before I finally took off and, can, and could handle my own. But that's fairly normal for, for careers to take five to 10 years to really, really gain that stable momentum so you can have, so you can feel that sense of stability. However, once it starts to hit that 15 to 20 year mark, whom I've worked with on a regular basis, that's when it might be necessary to do a little soul searching, to reach out to a professional and ask them, what's going on? Why am I in this position? Well, let's start with younger, aspiring, perhaps straight out of school artists. You're not a teenager anymore, now you're in your 20s, now you're an adult and you're, you're, you've got that professional energy going on about you. You haven't necessarily landed anything serious, if anything at all, and you're trying to get a name for yourself. What is it that can hold back being seen and getting those calls? Well, my friend Tyler Edlin said it extremely well in one of his recent videos, and you can go and check out his channel right over here. He said, too much diversity too early on. I really liked the way, I like the fact that he added the too early on aspect of it. I've been somebody who's always advocated for having a strong sense of where you belong artistically and making your art presentation, your portfolio, how you approach people as being not just showing people pretty pictures, but presenting people to your ecosystem Bobby Chu had another analogy that I remember him saying in one of his art talks many, many years ago, not in his new channel, which I'm going to plug as well. It's called Chu on This, C-H-I-U. I've been binging on that all week. Go subscribe. Fantastic channel. Um, go check it out right over here. Um, he talked about your artwork, your portfolio being your beautiful little island. You've got this beautiful little island. It's all yours. Okay, think of it that way. It's not just, you're not just kind of a jack of all trades, but that you do have a focus. And it, I, one of my earlier to art talks, I'm plugging a lot of videos, you can check out right over here. I talk about how um, you can try to please too many people. You can try to be too diverse. And you might not necessarily recognize the difference between a student portfolio and a professional portfolio. A student portfolio usually consists of life drawings that you did in school. It's a little bit of a mix mash of different things that you did in school, these different experimental styles, like maybe silk printing and some Conte drawings and some charcoal and some oil paints. And you kind of mix mash it all together. The problem with a portfolio like that and the problem with an approach like that is because it doesn't provide your director, the person who's hiring you, your client, with a sense of safety and stability. What a lot of people don't recognize, and what I learned very quickly being a director, is that hiring somebody is risk management. There's no there's no courses in, art, in artistic direction most of the time. You're usually a senior artist who has good communication skills and you get hired. Of course, I'm not gonna get into details about that. That's something I usually go at length with with my students and stuff. But the basic gist of it is that. So when I, you're sitting down and somebody's handing you a box of CVs. You don't have six hours to look through it and you don't have any training in portfolio analysis, but you don't need it because the minute you're sitting there looking at a portfolio in your hands, you realize I need to make the wisest, safest decision so that the person that I'm hiring, I have confidence could do the job that, that is being required of them and they can do so consistently. Okay, so having a good sense of your artistic style and artistic skill, or at least a genre of art that you like, doing it well, doing it to a professional standard, showing that you've done your homework and you've done the pro you've put the hours in to get good at what you're doing, and you present yourself extremely well is step one. But then following that, I want to see more and more and more examples of both that style and that consistency. A good analogy is if you go on your favorite music app like Apple Music or Tidal or Cobuzz or Spotify or whatever, and you're looking up a certain genre of music, my guess is when you're looking at for a genre of music, you're looking for one particular style. Maybe you're into relaxing, you know, some, some very relaxing lo-fi music for writing and studying. Maybe you're looking for something a little bit more, a little bit more energetic and electronic. Maybe you're looking for heavy metal or hard rock. Maybe you're looking for jazz or swing or salsa. 
you're looking for a genre, right? You're not just sitting there kind of flipping back and forth between different moods because that's not how people think. That's not what people are looking for. And when you're presenting yourself to a studio, showing that consistency in your work and not being a jack of all trades who shows logo design and gouache gouache paintings and charcoal drawings and digital paintings of cars and then character designs done in in snot what you're basically showing the director is that i don't know who i am and even if you did hire me to do that one success that one thing you like there's no promises i can recreate that success because i've only done it once or twice that doesn't fill a director with confidence okay now once you've evolved into your career and you're more senior and you've explored different things and you've worked professionally if you're somebody who's more at my phase of my career, where I'm older, then yes, I do diversify. But my diversity does not mean I'm completely changing gears and doing something completely different. That's a very bad move because that requires me to completely rewrite myself from scratch when it's not necessary. I consider my, my exploration and my, and, my, and my diversity as an expansion of my existing style. And there's a very big difference there. One is hitting the reset button and starting over from scratch. One is growth and evolution, okay? So you can't mistake these two. If you're earlier on in your career, get good at something. Don't be afraid to say, I love doing character designs in a futuristic, dystopian, cyberpunky type of style. Go for it and get really damn good at it so that when people are looking for your playlist, they know where to find you and they can see by your production, by the quality of what you're done, that you've done, that you belong there and that you have something unique and something evolved to present. It's not just a one shot deal. Now we're going a little bit further into the into a career. Think of yourself as being an intermediate to an intermediate advanced artist. The second can can affect artists at almost every phase in their career, but imagine you've been working, you've got a little bit of professional exposure, you're, you've been in it for five to 10, maybe even 15 years, and something new happens. Like for instance, in my career, 3D happened very early on, or uh, digital painting became a thing at the very early beginning of my career, although it was so early that it really wasn't much of a threat to my, exist to my existence at that point. For people who had been working traditionally, it was. And in this particular case where we're dealing with AI, or maybe 3D software has come in to, to help to, to speed up the process of producing 2D art, or maybe people do photo bashing or whatever. There's this new technology, there's this new technique that comes in. If you have an existing style that's extremely strong and you're really, really good at it and you find success in it, and it's something that's working for you, and you can see that there are job prospects ahead of you, then you're fine. Keep on keeping on. There's no reason for you. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if you find yourself consistently hitting these little roadblocks in your career where you're feeling, where you feel like everybody seems to be looking for something that you don't have, there needs to be a time. There ne you need to be able to say, hey, I have talent. Can I add a little ingredient that is compatible with what I already do that can help me to get quicker, better results? That can help me to reach out to better, to reach out to people better? Can I tweak my recipe a little bit so that it makes me a little bit more marketable on a grander scale? Okay? Or maybe you just need to reach out and make yourself more visible. As Bobby Chu said in his Island Anatomy, he said, it's one thing to have a pretty island but you need to create bridges to that island from different locations, using social media, using different platforms. You have to bring people to your island. My island, what's my island? It's my school. It's my website, right? This is my island. So when I tell you about my experience, and then I tell you that I run an online school, maybe this is your first time listening to my video. You might have no idea that I teach. Maybe you go, oh, I like the way Adam draws, or I like, I, like the way, I like the way he does this or that. And then you find out that I teach it, you're more likely to go out and reach out and say hi and ask me about my course. I don't publicize myself everywhere, but every now and then I'll mention the fact that I teach an online school and there's a link in my YouTube page, uh, YouTube description, and people go and click it and they check it out. 
I could have the best curriculum in the world. I could be the best teacher on the planet. But if you don't know I exist, that ain't gonna do me any good, right? So I have to make a bridge. What I'm doing here, what I'm demonstrating to you is that you need to be able to expand your horizons and say, is there anything else that I can bring into this? And the people who don't, just because they're afraid of change are more often than not doing themselves a disservice. So that's what number two is. You need to show a little bit of adaptability in your frame of work. Society, careers, skills cannot evolve and grow without adaptation, without a step forward. If it wasn't for adaptability, digital painting would not exist. Video game art would not exist as it does today. Heck, oil painting and gouache and photography <laughs> and videography would not exist unless somebody said, hey, what if I add this ingredient into my paints? What if I add this ingredient into my photographs? What if I try taking a picture this way? What if I add this technology to my camera? That came from adaptability. Okay. However, the third point comes in today. And the third point is sometimes adaptability, you need to have the professional savvy, the know-how to say, maybe adaptability is not the problem. Maybe I'm adapting too much. And this goes more often than not to intermediate to advanced artists, usually the more senior artists who have experienced success in some shape or form. Maybe you run a YouTube channel that's been doing really well. Maybe you have a school that's been doing really, really well. Maybe you have a career that's doing well and you've been getting lots of clients. And then one day after finally having enjoyed the comforts of stability and a nice regular salary where you can pay your bills and you can buy equipment and you can upgrade your life a little bit and you've, been, you've enjoyed those comforts that you strive for your whole life, all of a sudden it stops. You get laid off. You lose your job. Uh, people stop contacting you for jobs. Um, your YouTube channel starts to dwindle a little bit. Maybe it's not doing so well this time of year. Something happens that all of a sudden reminds you that safety is not guaranteed, that security and financial stability is not guaranteed. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, maybe I've gotten complacent and I haven't been keeping up with the trends. And you find yourself unemployed. You find yourself picking at straws trying to find something to do. That's when a very big toxic thing can get into your life. And the whole reason I decided to record this video in the first place is because I just happened to have my last, very sadly, have my last session with a student of mine who is my age. And if you're listening, you know who you are. <laughs> a very dear friend of mine now, somebody I care about a lot. Um, he's like, we're literally practically the same age. He's, I'm like, I'm like six months older than him, which makes me technically his senior, which means I know, I know more of everything that he does. This guy's done some pretty dope stuff in his life. And I'm not getting into specifics because I don't like calling people out and embarrassing them. But when we sat, very often when we'd sit down together and I'm speaking to him directly, if you're listening, and to everybody like him because he represents a personality type that I can very much relate to because I've been in his position before. That every single time I tried to point out one of his qualities, one of his one of his one of the things that made him shine from an un, from an objective third person unbiased opinion just looking at him for who he was and looking what he looking at what he did for what he did and telling it to him i kept getting yeah you know uh, that's great i uh, you know it's great advice adam you know but but there's this and there but there's that and there was a lot of buts and every single time i tried to kind of point him in a straight direction, he would instinctively redirect it, redirect it. He would take something tangible. He would take something visible. He could take something that I could see, something that could be manipulated and used in real time. And he would just muddy it up with all of these butts all over the place. And then I'd listen to him. He'd go on about that for about five, 10 minutes. And then I'd say, okay, and I try to redirect him back to the center line. And he'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I redirected him back to the center line. And it was literally a tug of war with him. 
Not only because he was very stubborn in his ways, but because he was very experienced and had experienced having that rug pulled out of under out from under him just like I had. And that's such an important topic for me to share with you today. When that rug is pulled out from under you, our instinct is to immediately start doubting everything that we're good at. Right? If you have a really successful social, maybe you're on Instagram and you're super, super successful on Instagram and you're getting hundreds of thousands of likes and your followers are shooting up through the roof and everybody loves you and you're getting a lot of clients to that and all of a sudden just people stop liking your stuff because some algorithm changed or some shit like that. Or maybe you're a YouTuber and everybody loves your videos and tells you wonderful things and then you post a video and you get like one fifteenth the views you normally did because maybe maybe the algorithm changed or maybe you did a couple of videos that were a bit boring and people didn't like it. it instinctively you go, I'm doing something wrong. Oh, maybe I should start doing TikToks. Maybe I should start posting myself on, oh shit, I really need to update my portfolio. Oh, maybe my art style is not popular anymore and you start to change yourself you start to change your brand drastically you effectively end up doing very often the same stupid mistake that beginners make <laughs> you end up back in beginner shoes again where you try to over diversify you try to reach out too many tentacles too far and you forget what you're good at and what you need to realize what you need to do first is stop and take a breath and say Okay, 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 okay. I've been, I've been caught up in my own head and I've been all over the place. Stop for a second and remind yourself, you got to where you are because you're extremely good at something. You got to where you are because you earned your popularity, because you earned your success, because you have physical, tangible things you can show to other people that demonstrate how good you are. A comic book, uh, art books, video games, uh, whatever. Portfolio, a client list, different jobs you've worked at. People hired you for a reason. You were successful for a reason. You weren't lucky. You've managed to maintain stability and success for years. Don't reset yourself and start thinking that all of a sudden you're obsolete. That is a very big mistake because what that ends up doing, especially later on in your career when you've already de dedicated decades of energy into a career, you burn yourself out real fast. And I thank my lucky stars that, that this talented, experienced illustrator reached out to me at the, and that we were at exactly the same age and that we've both had our chances to succeed and fail and succeed again and get up on our feet and navigate all of our personal issues to be able to flourish and be healthy because it, I felt I had the seniority and I had the weight behind my words to be able to tell him to shut up and listen and stop trying to start over again. Stop, stop, look, stop butting me and just listen to what I'm saying. You're talented. You're good. Keep doing what you're doing. If things are a little bit quiet, that's fine. Maybe you need to do a little something on the side, but don't start over from scratch. Don't think that a little bit of poverty or a little bit of, a little bit of lack of popularity means you suck all of a sudden. You don't. You need to be stoic. You need to hold the line and keep moving forward. And inevitably, what I experienced in my life was, through making the mistake of over-diversifying myself and having to come all the way back and doubling back, kind of like the analogy would be rearranging your studio to realize you had it right the first time and then you got to rearrange everything back and now you've broken your back in the process. And this is a real analogy for my life because I've done this multiple times. Stop, keep doing what you're doing and wait for the trend to come back around. And when it does, you're all the better. Your portfolio and your presentation is all the more consistent. And while everybody else tapped out of the race and everybody else gave up because they thought that the ship had sailed, you stayed on the boat and you didn't sink and now you're ahead of everybody else. And one of the big takeaways I can give you is when you stay in the race, even if you've got two balls and chains around each ankle, 
and you've got all of this life bullshit holding off your shoulders and you're stressed about money and all these things, but you keep on keeping on, you keep pushing yourself forward, you keep being clever, you keep innovating on what you've got, but you keep evolving on what you've got. You realize that one of the things that makes a great success, all of these great successes you've ever known in your life, the the Walt Disney's and the Gisela Bekshinskis and the Frank Frazetta's and the and the Brahms and the Loishes and the and all of these big name artists, all of them didn't give up when everybody else did. They didn't only have talent. It's not enough to just have talent. It's not enough to just be clever. It's not enough to just be marketable. You also have to be fucking patient. And sometimes things are slow, shit happens. But the patient ones are the ones that don't quit the moment times get tough, the moment that paycheck isn't everything it's supposed to be. And they keep on, and then they let that wave, they let the tide come back and pick them up again. And I guarantee you, when it comes to when it comes to artists like that, you end up leading the pack eventually. I had to learn that the hard way. With that said, hopefully I've offered you a little bit of help today. And of course, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.